So, Dan, always a pleasure to work with you, meet you, and welcome to Penn State. I understand it's your first time visit. We're thrilled yes, to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's awesome to be here. I'm really happy to be here. It's a beautiful day Good. and a beautiful campus. I know we're going to give you a lot of activity through the next couple of days, so uh, it's great to have you here. So um, this program is called Coil Perspectives, and it gives us a chance to ask leading experts the same question, or in this case questions, around a particular theme. Our theme this year is probably a familiar one to, to someone like you who's studying success and, and student uh, achievement in online learning and all aspects of learning, and it has to do with retention. So we know that retention is an issue in the face-to-face -face environment. It's also an issue in the online environment. It tends to get pointed out as a, um, as a big issue on the MOOC movement from a number of years ago. And so I'm wondering if you could share with us, what, what do you think about when you hear the word retention? What kind of comes to mind? What does it mean to you? Uh, and then I'm going to do a little follow-up with a few other questions from that. But let's start there. Well, if we start with the MOOCs, you know, these, these attrition rates, you know, these single-digit completion rates, yeah, that's a problem. But given that they're starting out with such huge numbers and people are sampling, I agree with, with the proponents that that's not that big of a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, if people need to finish the course, they will. I'm much, much more concerned with retention of undergraduates in these large, uh, in, in math and science, in, both in the community colleges and in uh, four-year institutions. You know, so many students are being tested into remedial math, remedial ghettos, remedial English as well. You know, the statistics of success from those programs is terrible. I mean, it's, it, it's a, I think it's a national crisis. Um, in my university, Indiana University, uh, you know, we have these courses that students have to pass a test to get in, and yet you're seeing between 20 and 30 percent grade of D or F or a W withdrawal, so-called DWFs. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really big problem. Not only is it keeping many students out of STEM fields, um, but it's keeping many students from graduating. The National Science Foundation issued a Dear Colleague letter on it in mathematics uh, saying we really have to do something. So um, does retention to you, or you, do you think of it as an in-course experience or in my program experience, or is it like a little bit of both? It's all of the above. Yeah, okay. You know, we want students to be able to pursue uh, their chosen degrees or their chosen fields of study and not be blocked. Uh, you know, we need to have um, people with diverse backgrounds in STEM fields, especially high tech, especially computer science. Mm -hmm. Many. Because computer science is such a hot field, it can be very selective. And so many, many people do not get the opportunities to study coding even because they lack the requisite math skills. They get shunted into these remedial courses, which are frankly terrible, yeah, yeah. which are ineffective, boring, and demeaning to, to many students. So um, with that as a setup, uh, I want to go to the second question, which has to do with if you had all the resources, time and money or what, what not, how would you, what would the system look like that you might create for a student to help them go from day of entry into their educational experience to day of exit successfully? There would be a lot of options. Uh, they would be, of course they would all be good, but some would be better than others. Mm. I just think that this, uh, we're always going to have a diversity of providers, but a diversity of ambitions. Um, you know, I think on one hand, the for-profits, the online for-profits, they deserve what they got. Mm -hmm. What I think was happening, uh, you know, six or seven years ago was outright fraud. Mm -hmm. They were collecting money from people who they had no expectation of education, educating or getting placements. But I do think now that the for-profits are being held to a level of scrutiny that the non-profits don't have to appeal to, I think that uh, um, they, uh, and some of these more entrepreneurial nonprofits, they are admitting students and, and, and educating students who are squeezed out of the existing, uh, out of more prestigious, uh, uh, more conventional institutions. So they are serving um, people um, who otherwise wouldn't be getting an advanced mm -hmm. degree. So if I had my way, I would certainly not want mm. to restrict innovation. Mm -hmm. um, there's an awful lot to be said for a face-to-face, -face, for a residential mm -hmm. experience. It's a really expensive thing to provide, both in terms of uh, an institution, but also in terms of somebody taking four years of their life. If you look at an innovation like, for instance, Georgia Tech's, their new online master's degree, it's, it is the exact same degree, 
but they're taking advantage of online technologies to do things that don't happen in their face-to-face -face classes. And that's a big focus on my work. My online courses are better than my face-to-face -face mm -hmm. courses by mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, my online courses are free. Mm -hmm. I let people enroll in my online courses mm -hmm. if they want to because there's no added incremental cost of additional mm -hmm. students. That's never going to be the case with a residential mm -hmm. program. I'd like to see those kinds of things being available to all students. But what I'm really sort of obsessed about these days is what do you do with the students who are still struggling? Mm -hmm. um, right now, there's a very limited number of options. Most schools are looking at a sort of some variant of the peer assisted mm -hmm. studies session that Yuri Treisman developed and that Carl Wyman has promoted, where you take advanced undergraduates and uh, pay them to, to be as tutors. And, Mm -hmm. they, they're certainly effective. The data is there that they work, that they decrease attrition from courses, mm -hmm. they increase grades and success. There's also some evidence that a lot of times they turn into test prep. Uh, you know, students want that. They want to know what's going to be on the sure, exam. Sure, and, sure. and so the tutors naturally move that direction. Well, mm -hmm. you know, we know that there's nothing worse you can do to a student than to have them memorize some very specific associations. Um, and these days, tests are being revised right. so often, that's really malpractice. Yeah. Right, to, to be preparing people for a test they're never going to take. I mean, preparing people for a test they're going to take is a little fraudulent, but yeah, at least yeah, they're going to yeah. get a better grade. Right. So that's, that's, the, that's mm. a lot of work needs to happen there. Okay. So just I want to play off on that for a moment, because this is something I've been struggling with in my own concept about personalized learning. And, and what I heard in, in your comment was a reference to the options of the learner being able to navigate through their educational experience by selecting options and such. But I, I do wonder about this idea in, for example, in competency-based education, which is clo tied closely to badging and, and they interrelate. What is our obligation to say to a learner, you know, this is really not your field of study. You're really not, you know, it's one thing to say we're going to get yeah, you through and really get you the question. grade, but do we also have an obligation to say, Dan, you're, you're, you're never going to be a brain surgeon. I know that's an overused example, you might be better at something else. How do we, how do we navigate and negotiate that space? I, I would be inclined, that's such a problematic thing to do. I think that uh, the existing systems of making sure that students are prepared for their prior course, for the more challenging courses is doing, a, a, on one hand it's doing, mm -hmm. it's already, that's already happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to be a brain surgeon, you know, there are a lot of obstacles in your way and they consist of standardized tests both to get in and get out. Um, I liked what um, Yuri Treisman said about this topic. He said, I, I, I don't believe in silver bullets, but I believe in silver buckshot. Uh, I think that uh, uh, different kinds of uh, support mm -hmm. are needed in different settings. So for instance, this existing peer assisted study session model doesn't work for online education at all. I mean, most of it is face-to-face. -face. So the tutors, you have to pay tutors, schedule rooms, and then the students have to show up. That's a big institutional cost. Um, what, we're, what we're piloting now, and hopefully the NSF will, will like our proposal uh, in January, is two alternatives to that. One is simply virtual supplemental instruction video conferencing. Sure. This sure. person will be in this virtual room. Right. Uh, we visited Kevin Burkhopes at uh, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, and he's running this amazing center. It's a drop-in center, mm -hmm. and he, he doesn't hire the math majors. He hires, or they're now math majors, they started out as something else, mm -hmm. and they struggled. And those are what he thinks make the best tutors. Yeah, and we yeah. visited last week, and we're, we're working with him on this proposal, and you walk into this room, and it's just packed in whiteboards and, and people, they don't look like math majors. Many of them are not math majors and they they really identified with what was happening there. Students are spending a lot of time there. That's really working. How do we package that and either do that as a networked SI or what really excites me is taking this model that I've been refining in my big open online courses that is true peer to peer mm -hmm. where you're, you're setting up structures where the person with the most expertise on a topic is the one that's bubbling up and people are interacting with each other. So Interesting. that's the thing that's most exciting to me is can we put up an infinitely scalable, effective supplemental instruction that can take on an unlimited number of students that doesn't require any institutional infrastructure whatsoever. 
So that's a really neat idea. I really like that's that's the uh, in my mind that's sort of should be the end game uh, is that we're leveraging student resources. Think of the advantage for the mentor now in in, in having that experiencing and teaching and all. So you're pulling all those elements together. Um, so my last question has to do with what can we do as a next step. So I, that's a great idea. It's a great scheme. How do we get there by one step? I think that, that institutions should really take a hard look at what are they doing for their struggling students and is it working? And not just in terms of, uh, yeah, we should be worried about attrition, but go in and look and see what's happening. If you're, if you're writing center, your math center, if your tutors are sitting around doing their homework waiting for people to show up, you got a problem. It should be immediately useful. Um, and it shouldn't be test prep. It should be really good disciplinary engagement. Yeah, yeah. Um, so to get there, I think that first of all, schools should take a hard look at that. What are you doing? A lot of schools are collecting a lot of money, fees for students on these courses, and that's what's funding some of these centers. Well, they should be looking hard at, at a couple of things, not just return on investment in the university time, but ROI on the student time. Sure. Let's sure. see, you know, it, if, if somebody's spending eight or nine hours a week or 12 or 13 hours a week getting one-on-one -on -one tutoring and they're succeeding in class, well, yeah. that's not the same as if somebody's able to, say, log on to a, the, the kind of thing that we envision where they're able to go in and, and, and look at it, you know, and get and engage with people in a way that really does help them understand the work conceptually, but also in a way that ensures that they pass these very challenging exams that make those courses so difficult. So, Right now, we're just trying to put together some pilots um, with informatics, uh, taking their existing tutoring structure and trying to do that in, uh, we'll probably use Zoom okay. or, or perhaps Canvas. And, mm -hmm. and how does that work? Um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you do that online synchronously? And then another little pilot, how do you do that in this asynchronous networked environment? Can you do it without any tutors or can mm -hmm. you think differently in a good moderated discussion, especially directly on student artifacts, the job of the, the mentor or the instructor mm -hmm. is to add additional content in threaded discussions where students are already engaged. It's a really easy way to keep what otherwise is a daunting thing sure. from being daunting because sure. you wait till the students are engaged and working on the problem and then they go look at someone else's work on that same problem and they can look at the instructor feedback in a way, in other words, it's about context. They sure. have to have ways right. to make right. this stuff meaningful. Terrific. Terrific. I appreciate your insights. Thank it's you, it's always a pleasure. And, uh, Thanks for everything uh, you I do I hope you here. enjoy the rest of your visit. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Larry.